So I will give a break. It'll be earlier than the halfway mark because I've got uh, sort of everything leading up to implants and then everything about implants. Because before we can talk about dental implants, we need to know the history of how we got there, sort of. Uh, my tendency, by the way, is to talk about this fast. I consciously try to slow myself down to this, but in my mind right now, I am working at a snail's pace. So the more excited about something I get, the faster I talk. Sorry, you can put that on your evaluation if you want, but I know, I talk too fast. All right, here's my stuff. Uh, Academy of General Dentistry, International Congress of Oral Implantologists, uh, and a member, not a fellow, of the American Academy of Dental, in, Dental or of Implant Dentists. That makes me qualified to talk about implants. Um, I have to do an awful lot of stuff to get fellowship. Just to maintain membership here, you gotta go through a lot of stuff and, and be constantly educated and all that. So um, I know from whence I speak, I've been doing implants for just over 20 years now. Uh, I do all phases of dental implants in my office, from bone grafting to the implants to restorations. I mean, soup to nuts, start to finish, it happens in, in one roof. That is my office, Norwich Dental Center. Some of you have seen it driving by. The logo just changed, that sign now looks like that. Um, it's a big place. I started from scratch, me, one chair, one employee. I still have the employee and the chair. Now it's 16 chairs and a bunch of people, and more dentists and all that. Um, but it's out in Norge. Um, just a general practice, but we do everything, with a few exceptions. We refer out the things we don't want to do. All right, that's all the commercial you're going to get. The rest of it is here. Why dental implants? I tend to wander, so sorry about that. I'll try to look at my screen a little bit. Why dental implants? Well, it, one of the things that my mentor, Carl Misch, talked about is it's not what can be done, it's what should be done. Because we can do a lot of things. We can just leave you toothless. We can build uh, partial dentures you take in and out. But the question is what should be done? And once you start evaluating a someone's mouth on the basis of what should be done, not just what can be done, you come up with some solutions and they look like dental implants. In 1919, 100 years ago, the average life of an American was 54 years old. So logistically, I would be dead and I'm pretty sure all of you would be too except for my wife, she just hit that mark. This is my wife, Kelly, right here. She never comes to see me speak, so she decided to come see today. Um, and she'll vouch for the fact that I talk fast all the time. But today, the average life expectancy in the US is 79. Now that kind of depends on what you look at. This is according to the US Census Bureau. Uh, that's an awful lot longer with teeth. When my grandparents were in their 40s, they had all their teeth taken out and wore dentures, top and bottom, and they thought they'd be gone within you know, another 10, 15 years. Well, they both lived to the age of 96. That was a long time in dentures, nearly half their lives, that's more than half their lives, with dentures in the mouth. My grandmother got so debilitated in her ability to eat that eventually she let me put a couple of implants in. I'll show you an example of what, what we did for her. And her biggest problem after that was gaining weight because she was eating so much better. So it's proof in the pudding. She kept on telling me, no, no implants, I won't live long enough. She was a bit of a cantank cantankerous person. Um, I finally convinced her. What, why are dental implants used? To replace missing teeth, that's it, that's all you got. I have had one, one other use. I have a patient who was born uh, hard of hearing in one ear and no ear on this side at all, big congenital defect. They actually put a dental implant in his skull, right back here, regular old dental implant, put an attachment to it that allowed him to clip on some kind of an audio transitioning box. He had a pretty cool setup. He let me, if you clip it onto a little metal stud and just push that against your own head, you hear what he hears, so I did that. It sounded neat. It sounded like a tinny um, old speaker, like an AM speaker. And that's how he hears. Oh, that was pretty interesting. Anyway, that's the other use for dental implants. So you replace missing teeth. End of story. That's all we do with dental implants. But there's a lot of ways to do it. What do you do about one or more missing teeth? Well, there's four choices. In every single case of missing a tooth or teeth, you have four choices. Number one, you can just do nothing. It's, it's, you have to shop at Walmart late at night in your pajamas. But you could do nothing. Um, removable solution, that is something that's going to come out of your mouth at night. You can put it in, but it has to come out. A fixed solution that is anchored to your teeth, this would be bridges, for example. We'll talk about that, not to be confused with partials. I'll differentiate between the two. And then finally, implant solutions. And in the implant solution category, there are other subcategories, and we'll get into that. That's the second half of my presentation. Doing nothing. Advantage. Cost. There is absolutely zero cost to doing nothing, not out of your pocket. There's a whole lot of social cost, but there's no cost whatsoever to doing nothing. That's the only advantage to doing nothing. What if your knee blows out? You get a new knee. What if your hip breaks? You get a new hip. Some people probably have one or both of those. What if your eyes go? You get glasses. What if your ears go? You get hearing aids. What if your tooth goes? You get an extraction. 
that's not a replacement. And yet that is historically how we've worked in modern America, modern world, I guess you would say. It's not a solution, oh, I forgot. it's not a solution, it's an exacerbation of the problem. Your tooth breaks, has to come out, abscesses, has to come out, whatever, it can't be saved, and it comes out. For many people, this was the end of the line. Okay, we're done. What? So that's the do nothing. That, uh, not a good option for most people today. Disadvantages of doing nothing. Again, you're gonna shop in your pajamas late at night at Walmart. I've seen those people on videos. They're all missing a front tooth. Tooth loss, here's another disadvantage. Tooth loss is the second major cause of tooth loss. In other words, the domino effect. If you have a space where a tooth used to be, other than decay, which is primary cause of tooth loss, having a tooth missing is the number two cause of the tooth next to it to go away. Number three is periodontal disease. But that's a significant statistic. If you're missing a tooth, there's a good chance you'll be missing some teeth in the near future. And of course, that's really just the domino effect. Within 10 years, 38% of the time, the tooth adjacent to the space is lost. So there's your statistic. 10 years may seem like a long time, but we're all living to be a lot older than it used to be. What about the impact on the bone? This is where the bone belongs around that front tooth. And as soon as that tooth was taken out, 50% of the bone loss within 12 months in the width direction. Now keep in mind, that's not all bone either. That is gums and that is gums. About two millimeters of gums here and about two millimeters thickness of gums there, which leaves you with about two, maybe three millimeters of bone up in there to put an implant. And an average implant is four millimeters in thickness. They make some smaller, they make some bigger, but there's a lot of science, a lot of physics going into four-ish millimeters that works for most teeth, most front teeth. So at 12 months, you're already missing a whole lot. At 12 months, height loss as well. We've got vertical bone loss here for missing two teeth in this case. The mirror image of those two is what's missing here. So he's not only lost depth like that, but also height like that. That makes it difficult. That does not make it impossible to restore properly. It makes it a good bit more expensive and more surgeries and more time in the chair, et cetera. It's always best to replace as soon as possible. Paresthesia of the nerves. Here's the impact on bone of doing nothing other than a denture, which may be what you're gonna end up with. If this is a fully grown mandible, there is a little nerve out here called the mental foramen. It's the nerve that we block. Anybody that's ever had a dental injection for the lower arch, you know that we shake your cheek, go way in the back of your mouth, behind all your teeth, give a shot, and the whole side of your face turns numb. That's because there is one nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, that controls all that business. It comes out, it starts back here up under the jaw, and it comes out right there. That little foramen right there. As time goes on, if you miss, are missing these teeth, there is no reason for that bone called the alveolar complex, the alveolar one, to stick around. So it starts to shrink. This is 15, 20 years later, and the alveolar process is, excuse me, the mental foramen is right down there. At the break, I encourage you to come up. I've got a lot of models I'll talk about. You should look at them. This is a representation of the picture on your left. The red dots show where the, the mental foramen is now. It shows progression of about every five years until the foramen is sitting right on top. If you put a denture on there and squeeze down on it, guess what you're pinching? All the nerves that control from here forward. So people say, oh, my dentures hurt. Well, yeah, because it's sitting right on top of a nerve or close to it. So that's a real problem. What about the impact on the bone? Aesthetic concerns, not just functional, but aesthetic concerns. A decrease in facial height, I love this guy. He's outside of Ripley's, believe it or not. And that's actually a, con a uh, condition, there's a word for that. I meant to look it up and put it on here, but when I was finding his picture, he came up with a particular word. If you can put your bottom lip to the tip of your nose, you have a, not a condition, but you have a, an ability. There's, there's a word, if anybody here Googles it while we're sitting here, I'll, I'll thank you for it. Um, this is a bigger concern for most people is the, is the cosmetic things that happen around the mouth when you're missing your teeth. Thinning of the lips in through here because they're just not being held out anymore. Um, accented facial commissures, oops, hold that too long. The commissures are these things right here, those little lines that come down off your lips when you're at rest. Those get accentuated with no teeth. A whole drop in muscle tone all in the whole face here. Again, the teeth and the alveolar process bone that holds it out is what keeps your face kind of stretched out over your over your jaw. Without the teeth and the jaw, they shrink away. You end up with a very much that Grandpa Jones kind of a look. Edentulous people, people with no teeth, they live five years less than people with teeth. That's a Mayo Clinic study. That's pretty impressive. Why? 
because their diet is terrible. If you have no teeth, you tend to go for soft fatty foods. You don't eat salads, you don't eat healthy stuff, you're not eating a whole lot of, of nutrition, you're eating fatty stuff. Those people tend to have higher cardiac disease and they go earlier. This statistic has held true for the last 25 years. I looked it up 25 years ago, it is still a statistic. Biting pressure with no teeth, 150 to 250 PSI normal biting pressure with natural teeth. That's you and I every day having a salad for lunch. If you are a grinder and clencher and your teeth are flat because you go out in bed at night and squeeze your teeth together and make noises, which I used to do, then you can get 1,000 PSI. That is a lot of pressure. And that's why you tend to crack them and wear them down and all that. Less than 50 PSI with a denture. People with dentures have a hard time eating salads or anything really good in steaky, nutrition -y, things like that. Lower dentures that fit. This is the most common place to find a lower denture is in a glass jar. Not all dentures, but lower dentures especially. 11% of people with lower dentures take them out to eat. Well, didn't we make them teeth so they could eat? You're taking your teeth out to chew, they put them into smile. Those people we call church teeth. They have church teeth. They put them into smile, go to church, when it's time to eat at home, they take them out. And if they go out to eat, they tend to eat soup or ice cream. 17% will wear their dentures, but say they chew better without the dentures in their mouth. So again, it just doesn't make sense. 16% never wear the denture that was made for them. It gags, it pinches, it doesn't, it, the adjustments never work. That's a lot of money to spend for 16% of the population to never even wear the denture. All of these things have been building for a long time in dentistry until the advent of implants. Solution number two, that was doing nothing, just letting it sit. Solution number two, removable solution. A removable partial denture is not a bridge. Some people call that, oh, my bridge. No, bridge is coming in a minute. That's fixed or, or locked down. A removable or RPD, partial denture, has clasps that come around and hook onto teeth. This is not the same thing. That's a different person. But those clasps, are, are, you've heard of shoots and ladders. I call that hooks and wires. If you smile with hooks and wires, you've got a partial denture. It's not very aesthetic. It also tends to wear on the other teeth. How much? Well, we'll get to that. I've got a slide for it. The cost. That's one advantage is the cost. $25 to $3,500 may not sound like a big advantage, but compared to implants it is. We're going to get expensive with implants. Sorry. That's the way it is. The disadvantages. What's the slowest way to pull a natural tooth? This was an old joke in dental school. Make them a partial denture. Because after five years of, of wearing a partial denture, these are your anchor teeth or your abutments, the ones that the wires wrap around. After five years, 23% of those anchor teeth are gone. That is a really slow extraction. They tend to work on it, they loosen, they break, they scratch, they harbor bacteria, which causes more cavities, ends up having root canals, that cracks. Can you wear a partial denture successfully for a long time? Sure, 77% do, but 23% don't. Eight years after placing it, just a few years later, now 38% of the anchor teeth are lost. Again, that's a pretty big number for me to call that a success. Unless somebody moves and then you've got a geographic success because you never see them again. Bone, bone is lost in height and width also. So the bone that's sitting underneath that denture is also being compressed and pushed on with nothing to support it except for the tooth in front. And it is constantly undergoing this barrage of force, it will also begin to shrink away because of it. The only reason alveolar bone, the bone that holds the teeth in, stays there is to hold something in. It, goes, it undergoes what's called disuse atrophy. Same as if you, uh, you break your arm and put it in a cast, those muscles all atrophy away. Disuse atrophy. The bone has the same problem. Teeth provide a stable base for it, so do dental implants. Implants also keep the alveolar process in check. The yeah, other advantage of partials is they come out, plain and simple. I mean, that's a disadvantage to me. I think it is to most people. If your teeth come out at night, I would call that a disadvantage. How about a tooth anchored or fixed solution? This would be an example of a bridge as opposed to a partial denture. Here, the two teeth on either side of it are cut down and a three unit bridge is slid down over into place. That was very successful for a long time. What is the advantage? It stays in place, doesn't come out. It's affixed to the two adjacent teeth, so your teeth don't come out at night anymore. That's good for one missing tooth. Until implants came along, it was really the only fixed solution. A lot of people have them, had, had do have, still wear successfully, but I have some statistics for you coming up on how successful that really is. 
If the two adjacent teeth need crowns already, then adding a pontic in the middle kind of makes sense. This would be an advantage. So if you already have a missing space, and you have two teeth on either side that are in really rough shape, and I say, listen, those two teeth would really benefit from crowns to keep them in place and stabilize them and not let them decay more and have, end up having root canals, et cetera, et cetera, then you're already two-thirds of the way in on cost to having a three-unit bridge. So we just lock up a pontic. The pontic is the fake tooth in the middle that floats above the gums. Lock in a pontic to that when the whole process is fabricated, it goes in place. That's one good reason to save a ton of money and get a reasonable result with the knowledge of some limitations. There's also been a long track record of reasonably good success. I'm not going to say overwhelmingly good success. We'll talk about statistics on it. So the biggest disadvantage is when something breaks, it really breaks. When, that, when this bridge broke loose, that tooth is no longer able to be crowned. So now we don't have a one tooth problem, I've got a three tooth problem. That gets more expensive. What can we do? Well, if you didn't have implants, you could anchor to the next tooth and have a four unit bridge. How long do four unit bridges last? Not as long as three unit bridges. Let's get into some stats. When a bridge does fail, this is a three unit bridge. When a three unit bridge fails, 30% of the time it takes the tooth with it, just like that. So it failed, tooth is going away. At 10 years, 10% 10 of three unit bridges are gone. That's the most conservative statistic I can find. Another one says after five years, 15% are gone. Dentistry works a lot on the five year survival rate that is quoted in every study and literature about how long things last. What's the five year survival rate of what you just did for a patient's mouth? The so one of the worst stats that I've seen is 85% survival rate at five years. I'm being generous here, 10 years at 10%, because I got all this data from the same source. I wanted to be consistent, not cherry pick my information. At 15 years, though, 33% are gone. Again, a three-unit bridge. That's a lot of loss to have that much money wrapped up in it. 25% of these develop cavities underneath the abutment teeth. That's how they end up getting lost, with significant cavities. And it's hard to see a cavity underneath a crown or bridge if it's not going down the root. If it's going up in towards the crown, it's being hidden on x-ray from that crown, which is shadowing over it on the x-ray. If it's down at the root, we find it sooner, usually more salvageable. Although, with root surface decay, it's usually terrible quicker. It doesn't take much decay in the root to wreck a tooth. 15% of those need root canal treatment. 11% just come off. You're eating a sandwich or a Tootsie Roll or a Now and Later or something like a Milk Dud at the show, and boop, there's your bridge in your hand. Happens. That's not the end of the world. Just coming off is actually okay. If you bring it right in, we can clean it up and put it in. If you wait a week, it usually doesn't fit anymore because the teeth have shifted ever so slightly and they won't fit anymore. So if you ever do lose a bridge, something comes out, call your dentist right away. If it's a Saturday or Sunday, call right away Monday. <laughs> a, few, a couple of days won't hurt you. 10% um, of these that are gone in 15 years were fractured. That's why they failed. Um, that's for all for a three year bridge. If you get a longer span, things get worse. The statistic that quotes 85% survival rate at five years for a three unit bridge quotes 60% survival rate at five years for a four unit bridge. They just don't last. There's too much flex. No matter how stiff we make these things, there's a little bit of flex on that pontic in the middle. And when that starts to flex, the ends lift up, decay seeps under. There's a problem with it. 6% of healthy teeth prepared for crowns will later need a root canal. So if you have two more or less healthy teeth, and you're going to put a three unit bridge on there, you're going to prep those two, you're going to drill those two teeth down. 6% of the time, a tooth that was not heading for a root canal ends up getting a crown and needs a root canal. That's just statistics. It's been that way forever. It has a lot to do with the fact that we're abusing the tooth with the drill. We've got a lot of things going on, hot and cold on there. The, the inside is exposed for a while. The tooth can go sour. It's one of the, the bad statistics of what we do. But the 94% that make it are are good. And a root canal is not the end of the world for a tooth, it's just one more expense, one more procedure to go through. If an anchor tooth on a bridge had a root canal, so here we are, needed a root canal, if one of those two units on the side of the bridge needed a root canal, four times more often that tooth's going to be lost. All right. Which brings us to a solution for all that garbage. So all that's the bad news. In the mid-60s, early 70s, a guy by the name of Ingvar Brandemark out of Sweden started playing with titanium implants. He was putting them in dog legs, sorry if you're dog lovers, but that's where all research starts, is on some animal that's not a human. He eventually, in the early 80s, got to humans, and he started placing implants that don't look like this anymore. Started placing implants in the mandible, right down in the very front, 
and started anchoring teeth to them, dentures. And that revolutionized dentistry. It took us from the dark ages to modern day, kind of overnight. Over the years, there have been as many as 50 dental implant companies. We're down now to about a dozen really good named companies. I think if you get to other countries, you'll find locals for sure, but there are a dozen or fewer good named local implant companies now. And that was a consolidation from the mid 90s of over 50. Um, this is the brand that we're using right now in my office called BioHorizons. Oh, I'm not gonna get into the physical features, but uh, the man who was my mentor, Carl Misch, he was the smartest guy in all of implant dentistry. He died a couple years ago of a brain tumor, very sad, relatively young, 65. Um, he was such a phenomenal lecturer and researcher that he took and, for, uh, and founded a two-year doctoral program at University of Alabama in dental implant physics. What came out of that was two students, two doctors every year, with a degree, a doctoral degree in implant physics. He put them to work in a brand new company called BioHorizons and they started building the best dental implant you could possibly think of. They took all the research they were doing and they kept applying it and, and they kept modifying their implants along the way. It took about 10 years until they really felt they had nailed every little thing. So many fine details go into this. And even in terms of just what does the thread look like? Because it doesn't have to look like that. It can look like any one of those. And there's science behind that. It's not just pick one up at Black and De or at uh, Lowe's and see what, see what sticks. Uh, surface treatment, is it shiny or smooth? Does it come back in? Is the hex on the outside or on the inside? There's one that's on the outside. There's one that's got no hex whatsoever. It's called a Morse taper fit. Here's one of the trilobe. All these variations came along. This is a very good one. They're mostly very good now. In my opinion, this is truly the best design out there and what we've been using. Um, I would like to take a small break now for restroom. It may be a little bit early, but once I start talking about implants, I'm just gonna keep on going. So can we take a 10 minute break?